So welcome everyone. Uh, we realize, you know, Zoom fatigue is a real thing. So we appreciate, you know, you adding another Zoom to your day. Um, but today we're gonna talk about women in private equity, the challenges, the trends, some of the how to's. Uh, we have three amazing executives on the panel today who I have a deep respect for. So thank you each um, so much for, for taking time today. Um, we've also opened the Q&A, so if anyone listening has any questions, feel free to ask in the chat box, and we'll make sure to get those answered. Um, thought we'd start with some introductions, if you all would introduce yourselves and tell a little bit about your background, that would be great. Barbara, you want to start? Sure. Thanks, Jen. I'm Barbara Casey. Um, I have about a 30 year background in healthcare in the healthcare industry. Um, I have worked for some very large corporations, but now, uh, you know, I'm part of a portfolio of owned companies. Um, I was a management consultant for about 10 years. Um, I then worked for HCA and was in corporate strategy. I led healthcare at Cisco Systems for about eight years um, as the basically the global industry leader. And then for the past couple of years, I've really been an entrepreneur and then now an executive in kind of a portfolio of companies. So that's me. Great. Melissa, do you want to go next? Sure. I'm Melissa Mounts. I am a managing director with GTCR, which is a private equity firm in Chicago. Um, we have, GTCR has been around for 40 years. Last year, we celebrated our 40th year and we were planning on having a big party, but that shall happen later this year, hopefully, um, <laughs> since nobody had any parties last year. Um, but uh, we um, raised our 13th fund last year. It's a seven and a half billion dollar fund. We focus on investments in healthcare and many of the different sub industries in healthcare, financial services, um, and fintech, and also technology, um, media, and telecommunications. Um, we, uh, I lead executive talent and diversity for the firm. Um, so I work with our portfolio company leadership and our investment teams in identifying great talent. Um, I do a lot of board work as well and uh, diligence and other types of projects and initiatives around human capital in the portfolio. Um, this is, I got into private equity about eight years ago. I was with another firm before I joined GTCR and my background is big four consulting, um, uh, also uh, very large scale talent um, acquisition, um, M&A integration, um, but uh, you know, I stumbled my way into private equity, which has been a great uh, find. Mm -hmm. so. well, thank you. And Christina? Hi, I'm Christina Pye. Um, I'm a partner at Fort Point Capital. I'm actually a Boston native, um, grew up outside the city, uh, went, went to school at Dartmouth College, and then started my career as an investment banking analyst at JP Morgan and their consumer healthcare group. Um, then transitioned into private equity. I was an associate at a firm in New York um, called FTG Associates for a couple of years um, and then moved back to Boston to work at a family office, um, which was started by Tony James, who was the president and COO of the Blackstone Group um, and his two brothers. And we had a very broad investment mandate. So we were primarily focused on lower middle market buyouts, but we also did a couple of venture deals and bought a 40,000 acre cattle ranch um, as well. <laughs> uh, but then I... Uh, I uh, decided to go focus on my true passion, which is lower middle market private equity. I joined Four Point Capital in 2011, um, and they were just they just finished their first deal as a fundless sponsor. We raised our first fund in 2012. Um, you know, we've raised our second fund. We're actively deploying it, and currently, I focus on. Um, basically all, all aspects of the firm. So I'm involved in fundraising and deal sourcing, deal execution, and I chair the boards of the portfolio companies that, um, that we invest, well, that I work on and that we invest in. Great. Well, all of you have a, di a little slightly different background, so it'll be interesting to get your perspectives on uh, the questions we have today. 
Um, and again, thank you for your time. I know you're all very busy. Um, so for the questions, let's go ahead and start with the, the first one. Um, you know that women surprisingly make up only about a little over 9% of senior positions and 18% of the industry's workforce in private equity. I was a little shocked to see that, but as, as a woman in private equity, you know, what are the challenges that you all have faced kind of breaking that barrier uh, at the table, um, you know, given it's typically been predominantly male industry? Yeah, I think, you know, I, I was fortunate when I started out my career at JP Morgan, it's probably the most diverse um, place I've ever worked. Uh, we had female managing directors, we had folks from all over the world. And so, you know, I had some great role models. Um, I then transitioned to private equity and I was their first female hire. Um, I think the managing director who ran the firm didn't tell his wife that he'd hired me for six months um, because I don't know, I, he looks like a hobbit. I don't I don't know why she would ever be concerned, but um, anyways, <laughs> she, uh, so, you know, I think it was as an associate, I think it was pretty tough and it was, you know, 20 years ago, um, you know, and it was still the kind of place where I, you know, I remember all the folks at the firm, you know, going to strip clubs and, you know, meeting with Jenna Jameson because they, they, you know, thought she had some business and, you know, not inviting me, not that I wanted to go, but, um, you know, and I think there was a, you know, there, I think there were some really serious cultural issues in the private equity world, but I think it's gotten much better over time. You know, I speak to other women that work in private equity firms, and I think having women in sort of mid-level and senior level positions and having that be normalized, um, as well as just, you know, generally, I think as a society, more of an awareness towards, you know, how people should act to be, you know, inclusive and recognize diversity, I think is really, um, you know, driven a lot of the improvement that at least I personally have seen in private equity. Um, and I think, you know, to be a woman in private equity is sort of a double edged sword. Uh, you know, I think it helps to be memorable, right? I mean, you could go into a sale process and a CEO meets with 10 teams and you're the only woman. Right. And so you definitely stand out. And I think it's it's a wonderful opportunity, honestly, um, just to build your own brand and to you know sell CEOs on a partnership and to um, you know really sort of blaze a trail. And you know, for me, I've never. I mean, you always find you know people that say silly things to you, but I mean, I think that probably happens once every couple of years. And you know, honestly, I think being a woman in private equity is 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 you know, I find my I feel like I'm fortunate. I will, I'll share one story, just, um, um, you know, kind of adding on to what Christina said, and you've made some great points. Um, I was in a management meeting with my former firm, and it was a healthcare company, and all of the executives on the other side of the table were female. So the CEO, the COO, the chief medical director, and I'm trying to think who the fourth one was, um, maybe in, you know, sales or, or something, they were all, um, all females. And on our side of the table, it was myself and three of my you know, male colleagues um, in the healthcare industry group. And after the meeting, one of my colleagues said to me, Melissa, that was the strangest meeting I've ever been in. And I said, really, why? What, what, what was strange about it? And he said, it didn't matter who, which one of us asked the question, they all answered to you. And I said, welcome to my world. Right? <laughs> <laughs> and, you know, but I think that, you know, Christina, to your point is that, you know, being able to be memorable, or I even look at some of the deals and the investments that are coming through and to have that, um, you know, um, to be able to build those relationships with female executives or female leadership teams. Um, there are some opportunities, right, that are uniquely, you know, a, a female perspective, right, is needed on those, um, you know, different deals. So I think there is a real opportunity to differentiate in terms of the diversity, you know, of thought, um, you know, that, uh, you know, adding that diversity to that team. Um, and what I found too, you know, within private equity is, it's not that I feel that women have been excluded. It's just not where the natural networks have been formed over time. Mm -hmm. And it's not intentional, 
Um, and so part of the work that I do, you know, with my um, colleagues and partners is just, you know, constantly introducing them to great female executives. Yeah. Um, because, you know, in, it, we've especially done that with board uh, directors, independent directors. And I always laugh, I, I tease them, I say, you know, you can, you know, list off five men off the top of your head for that independent director role, and you struggle to come up with one female. And so this is something that we just need to own. We need to build our networks very, very deliberately um, within, you know, diverse uh, executive groups, females and uh, ethnic groups, and, uh, and be able to just have that recall then of great we have now a board role and here's a diverse slate that we can name off the top of our head so i mean that's you know i think it is really just continuing continuously intentionally building you know that that network mm -hmm. um at all all levels board firm you know otherwise or else people just go you know we're all human and we go into what's comfortable yeah, I, I couldn't agree more with both of you, Melissa and Christina. I, I've been in different, I'm the newest member to something called private equity. And uh, I, uh, I've been in boardrooms and conference rooms where I'm the only woman. I've also been in situations where, you know, I've been, I'm, it's, it's many women and it's, and I'm not alone, sometimes all women in healthcare, especially, as you know, there's more female executives in healthcare. Where I find myself now, I am I'm I have a board meeting later today, and I am the only woman. So, <laughs> you know, back to that scenario, and I I would wholeheartedly agree, Melissa, that the networks just aren't there, that they weren't there. So it's not intentional, but I do think our job as senior executives in this particular space is to continue introducing you know, more of, of those powerful and, and talented women to these particular positions. Um, and, you know, that's what I try to do. And it's, 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 you know, it's, it's easy because there's plenty of them, but it's also incumbent, I think, upon all of us to really serve and help younger women coming up or people just coming out of school, you know, to get more of those opportunities to be to be in the flow of those networks um, as a natural as a natural course of business, and I think that's something that does have to change. Yeah, well, that's good. That's and that kind of leads us into our next question, actually. Of you know, we as a recruiting firm are seeing a lot more requests for a diverse slate, whether it be an executive level CEO position or we do a lot of board work as well, and historically boards are, you know, if you look around, it's, you know, older males and diversity means many different things now. And part of that is the female side of it. Um, but we're getting a lot of our clients requesting more of a diverse candidate pool. And, you know, there, there are a lot of significant benefits to a diverse team. So if you look at the PE industry overall, and your companies within the portfolio or companies you've worked in, like how, how do you feel this has been, that change of the need for a diverse pool has, has impacted kind of your companies within your portfolio? I mean, I can answer this because we're hiring, we're growing so fast and all the different organizations are growing and we're always looking for different types of talent and specifically diverse, a diverse slate of talent. And I would say, and, and I have an organizational design background, so I try to break the job roles down into the competencies that are necessary to do the job. And what I've been really, you know, what my colleagues and I have been trying to do is make sure that we're using those competencies very much as, the, as a way to look at who we recruit and how we recruit, um, because those competencies can be seen from different walks of life, um, you know, not somebody maybe that's 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 created a well-trodden path, you know, to these roles. It could be other sources for how we find these individuals, but having the core competencies will ensure that they can actually deliver on on what the job performance requires. So, you know, having more of an open mind and really trying to source talent from maybe alternative places. 
Yeah, I mean, I, I think it really varies by portfolio company. Um, you know, one of our companies is a B Corp, so they're in business for both profit as well as sort of the greater good. And they've always focused on diversity and employee engagement and reaching out to, you know, foster care programs, um, you know, prisons, et cetera, to give people a second chance. And, you know, they've ended up with a very diverse team. Um, you know, what we found actually was pretty interesting last summer was I think the Black Lives Matter um, protests really did strike a chord with the number of our management teams. And there started to be more of a, and all of them actually unprompted came to a, the next board meetings and said, you know, hey, we, we want a more diverse candidate pool. And we said, well, why don't we just dig into why, you know, we've ended up where we are. Um, and a lot of them said, well, you know, we went to our recruiters and they said, well, you always hire the same person. So we were giving you the same person. And they said, okay, well, you know, we want to see a slate where 50% of the applicants are, you know, minorities or women um, uh, or, or a combination. And, you know, I think that's started to work. I think the two areas where I find there's still to be a lot more work that needs to be done is one is around what I would term as unconscious bias. Um, so I think there's a number of folks that say they want a diverse team, but then you show them a diverse slate and they'll say, well, you know, this guy uh, would re really fit in the culture here um, because he's familiar. And I think that's a little bit of what Melissa was talking about, you know, but here's a woman who has five years more experience, is seasoned and whatever, but it's not as comfortable a fit. And so they don't tend to gravitate. And I don't think it's malicious, but I do think there's a lot of unconscious bias at work. And I think it's incumbent on us to really, you know, push for the most qualified candidates, particularly in scenarios like that. Um, you know, and secondly, I do think that, you know, some of the, our companies have started to do a really great job on the sort of junior level. Um, but, you know, really to start to get women, as you mentioned, in the, in the boardroom and in the C-suite, I think a lot of our companies, which tend to be on the lower end of the middle market, so I think companies with, you know, anywhere between 25 to 300 million in revenue, um, you know, we need more, um, you know, women, people of color in our boardroom and in the C-suite. Um, and I think that'll take time to accomplish. Yeah, I agree. And I think there's you know, coming from the different industries and the different verticals that we serve, uh, there are some that just aren't, you know, they're, they're the talent. The manufacturing. Yeah. Yeah. You know, so that happens. But I think as, as the, our whole, you know, uh, focus is, is changing um, and moving and people are becoming more comfortable with female executives at the table, uh, we'll, we should start to see those industries also, um, you know, become more diverse. And then I've also seen too in the boardroom, right? The conversation when you do have a diverse, um, you know, board of directors and Barbara, I'm sure you see this, you know, with a lot of your board work, the discussion just changes. So it's really interesting where we have introduced, um, you know, new board members and diversity on those boards. Um, they are well ahead of some other boards in terms of some of the issues around ESG and diversity and, you know, just employee matters and, you know, engagement. Um, and so that lens and that accountability, right, that the board is really holding, it's not this rote, you know, type of discussion that's happening, it really, you know, starts to evolve in a much different and much more, you know, fulsome way. Mm -hmm. So I think, you know, um, and when I look at the talent pools that we're, um, that we're sourcing from for, you know, uh, diverse board members, um, women are very, they've gone through the governance education and the training and the certification mm -hmm. So they are coming in wanting to be, right, the best board member that they can yeah. be and really yeah. challenging, you know, that status quo um, and not, you know, just kind of, oh, okay, this is how this board, you know, flip through the slide. Okay, check, 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 you know, we're good. Um, it's really, you know, the contribution that they, you know, are, are looking to make um, and even how they're analyzing or assessing the opportunities that they have. It's, you know, look, if this is not, if there are not meaty problems to solve, if there's not, you know, a contribution from my background that I can add, 
I'm really not interested in the board. You know, you tell me what the culture of this board is and how it operates because they want to come in and make an impact, which I think is, you know, phenomenal. So there's just a, you know, it, it, it's getting in deep into that pool. Um, it's just a, a, a mindset shift, you know, I think. Yeah. We're getting some um, questions uh, coming in and uh, one is kind of related to, you know, knowing that your companies uh, in your portfolio are becoming more open to a diverse, you know, slate of candidates. Do you, within your own position, or do you see any anyone in your companies um, that are asked to do more female associated tasks um, within your with, within your company? Are you are you um, asked to do more HR related tasks or um, tasks that are typically associated with a female uh, background more so than your male partners? I have not been, you know, I think, you know, at four point we've, we've got a great culture and I've never been asked to, to do those types of things. I am sometimes, you know, maybe this is a situation that Melissa was alluding to, but, you know, I have brought been brought in if there's a deal that folks are looking at and there's a female CEO just because they think that, yeah. you know, that would be helpful. And I, you know, honestly, I think it, it has been in certain situations, uh, but, you know, I, I don't think I've been treated any differently because I'm a female. Yeah, I don't think I've been treated any differently either. Now, I will say that I, I end up gravitating a lot toward um, employee engagement and, you know, figuring out, I mean, just today we had a discussion, we, I'm doing a deep dive in one of the companies, you know, really getting to know a lot of the folks who work on the front lines and different levels and things. And we realized, wow, you know, we had some very, what, what we would call essential workers who had to go do some things where they were sacrificing a lot during the pandemic. And I don't know that we've properly made that visible and, and appreciated them in a way that we probably need to, right? So, I mean, so I think, we, and I'm the one who's like, wow, we really need to shine a light on this. We should do some recognition, call this out, let people see this was a, a, a very brave and Herculean task that they did. And I'm the only one, you know, right now that has seen that. So I don't know if that's uniquely female or if it's just more human. Mm -hmm. <laughs> maybe I like to look at it as maybe I am seeing things that are more human than yeah. some of my male counterparts. But um, so I probably gravitate to some of those things more, but I don't think anybody's asking me to do that. Mm -hmm. I think it's I think it's like what Melissa said, you're we're having different conversations probably because I'm at the table and I just see things slightly differently. Mm -hmm. um, I don't know if it's more female. I just hope it's more well-rounded, you know, yeah. on yeah, and I think, you know, it, yeah. and there are, there are specific traits that as females we have, Yeah, that, you know, like nurturing <laughs> might be a little more than some, some of our, our male partners, but that's just kind of innate in us. I do have, I mean, to answer that question, not from my own personal experience, but um, just having mentored some other women in, um, in my organizations, uh, I know, you know, one, one person that, you know, she did feel like that she was always asked to do the PowerPoint presentation versus the Excel spreadsheet. And so it was more qualitative. <laughs> she interpreted is more qualitative tasks versus quantitative tasks. And, you know, she, you know, she told me that and she was, you know, frustrated, right, with the partner who was asking her to do that. And, you know, I said, look, you know, how do you respond to that, right? Um, maybe, you know, a response is, you know, you know, you call them aside and say, hey, I feel like, you know, I have, a, you, you know, you're always asking me to do this. And I feel like that's a really good strength of mine. And what I want is to be challenged you know, or I want the opportunity to do the more quantitative too. So could you just ensure that you give me, you know, that balance? But I think to Christina's point, these are unconscious biases and people don't know that that's maybe where they're gravitating to or that you're feeling like that's a trend. Um, so I think it's incumbent upon each of us, right, for our own development and 
um, engagement to then, you know, be able to talk about those things and say, look, this is where I want to develop, or these are the things and, you know, and these are the things I feel like I have a high proficiency at, and, you know, you, you should ask other people maybe to develop in those areas. So, um, you know, but I think you have to be very assertive, especially in the private equity environment. You have to, and not in a negative or confrontational way, but, you know, um, help people along and help them know what you want. Absolutely. I think, you know, I, I haven't heard very many um, negative responses to when someone speaks up and just brings awareness to what their, their partners are doing. Typically, they're so unaware and it, that behavior then stops, which is, which is always what we want. So that's good. Um, you talked a little bit about the pandemic. So post-pandemic, what are you, are, are, have any, are we, are we post-pandemic? No, <laughs> I would like to, I'm going to think positively <laughs> post-pandemic. So let's say we are post-pandemic. You heard it here. Um, we are post-pandemic. <laughs> <laughs> um, you know, what are some of the trends that you've seen in, in private equity and has anything changed within your company's, um, you know, post, post-pandemic? <laughs> You know, us being, having been, you know, 40 years, right, in one office in Chicago, um, we're a very face-to-face -face and, you know, in-office environment, and this forced us to be, you know, comfortable virtually. So I think, you know, that has really, um, I, I think it's, you, had, had we not, you know, had the past, you know, whatever, 16 months in this virtual world, we wouldn't be adopting technology. And I think in a really good way and, um, you know, looking at opportunities, um, our fundraise, since it was, you know, in the fall, we did all of our LP meetings 100% virtually, which I don't think anybody would have thought was possible to raise the size of fund that, you know, we ended up raising. Um, but, you know, it was, and we were all in the same boat, right? I mean, so it wasn't like, you know, we were deciding not to, you know, do face-to-face. -face. I mean, that's the way we just, it was necessity. Um, but I think it's gotten us really comfortable with how relationships can be built, how work can be done. Um, and, you know, we're all happy to be back in the office, um, but knowing, right, that we have a lot of technology um, capabilities now to make us super productive um, when we're not together. Yeah, I know. I, I do agree. I mean, I think that obviously everyone had to pivot um, from, you know, an in-person environment to a virtual environment. And I think there's an awareness you know, I think there's a couple of things going on. I think there's a, a war for talent, um, not only in the private equity industry, but for a lot of our portfolio companies. And I think, um, you know, the mindset shifting a bit to try to become more an employer of choice. And I think that that, you know, uh, adopting more of a hybrid approach or a remote only re approach, um, you know, I think has become more prevalent and accepted um, both in private equity as well as at our portfolio companies. But, you know, I think overall the industry is very healthy. I think, you know, a lot of the portfolio companies weathered um, the pandemic a lot better than other, than maybe we all thought in March of 2020. Um, you know, and I think the valuation multiples remain sky high. Um, great time to sell your portfolio companies. <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's, Emily, it's a little bit harder to buy, you know, and, and, and really I think there's, you know, there's a lot of things that are happening there, you know, change, potential changes in capital gains rates and whatnot. There's a record amount of deal volume. It's, you know, it's just a really healthy industry. And I think private equity continues to become a more vibrant part of the economy. Um, just a lot more capital, as Melissa mentioned, you know, flowing, flowing into towards successful funds. Um, you know, I think we'll continue to drive the health of the industry going forward. Uh, so, you know, I think weathered very well, um, as you know, we all were very concerned in March of 2020. And I think it's, it's gone much better than we might have thought. Hopefully it's done. But yeah. So am I still frozen, Jen? Nope, you're good. Oh. You're good now. Okay. Um, I'll share maybe a, a unique industry perspective for healthcare. There has been, as everyone knows, just a ton of, of money raised, you know, gangbusters, tons of new startups that have started in digital health, especially since, since the pandemic. 
And I guess my big thing is, I, I believe that a lot of them are, they're very niche. A lot of them are created with, uh, you know, some entrepreneurs that don't know the industry that well. I guess I'm, I'm curious to see how they will fare. I think, um, you know, there's been a, just an explosion in the virtual care and telehealth market. And I think that a lot of them, again, you know, are, they're niche. And so I think consolidation is, is ripe for that market. Um, I do believe that they will struggle. I think a lot of them will struggle in the actual day-to-day -day of growing those businesses and really capitalizing on, you know, the promise. So I, I'm just interested to sort of see some of that play out. Um, and, you know, I, I think I think it'll be, a, like I said, it'll be a wild ride uh, for the next few years. Um, but but there's a ton of interest in digital health across the board. So it's really how applicable and how well will they sort of get the, the healthcare nuances and complexity to be successful. So given, you know, the, the openness to remote meetings and even remote board meetings, do you feel post-pandemic post that... Um, to sit, you, you can still have that voice within a, a board meeting on a Zoom. Um, has any of that changed as far as decisions your companies have been able to make um, not being together and not having that kind of that presence? Yeah, I mean, we're pivoting back to in-person. So all of our board meetings for Q2 are, are in-person. Um, you know, I honestly, I missed working with our management teams and having dinner with them where I think you get a lot of this sort of informal, um, you know, uh, information on what's going really going on and just are able to, you know, form those personal connections with people to influence them to, you know, do what you want them to do essentially. Um, and so, you know, we're really just happy that things are back. Um, you know, I think for management presentations, we're meeting with the teams in person, we can get a much better read on the quality of the team, on the team dynamics, um, you know, really get up to speed on the business model and, and sort of validate whether we think growth opportunities are, are achievable or not. Um, I think that's much easier to do in person um, and, you know, board meetings, we're going back to in person and we just, we just believe it's the be best way to work with our companies. Mm -hmm. I think a lot of the Larry side trips, um, you know, will fall away and, you know, like Melissa said, I think in, on fundraising, we're hoping a lot of the initial meetings with LPs might be done over Zoom. And then if you're really serious, then, you know, potentially progress towards an in-person to cut out all the seven trips to Cleveland and Chicago that you know, <laughs> where the, there's definitely no way that they're coming into your fund. Um, so, you know, I think, and you know, I, I think a lot of that, um, you know, maybe, maybe travel will be reduced by 25%, but we think for the most important meetings, you should be in person and that's what we're doing. We agree with that. Um, I think from candidate perspectives, um, you know, candidate accessibility, executive accessibility was at an all time high during the pandemic because people weren't traveling. Um, and so to continue to build those networks and have those initial conversations and get to know you meetings and expanding that network, especially along these diversity lines, um, you know, Zoom or Teams or, you know, Cisco, WebEx, whatever you use um, has been a huge accelerator. Um, you know, now, you know, of course, we will always meet people, you know, that we're bringing into um, one of our boards or our portfolio companies. But I think, you know, just to, um, you know, utilize that technology, it's been um, very, very helpful. And literally, I have forgotten how to dial a conference bridge. You know, during this pandemic. So, and I think about even doing that and it's like, oh my God, I can't even remember, you know, your passcode was just like on, you know, your fingers just knew where to go. Uh, it's, you know, now I'm just, if it's not a Zoom, you know, link click, I'm not sure how to operate it anymore. So, but I find the quality of conversations um, are just so much better on Zoom. And I think about how many conference calls I did, you know, pre-pandemic, so. Mm -hmm. Barbara, have you seen any any change to kind of the the po the uh, post pandemic remote work and any decision factors there? 
Um, it's harder for me to say. I was a Cisco executive for, you know, about almost 10 years and I live that way. <laughs> so I, I was very used to the, this sort of format and lived in it for all that time. And then pretty much when I started, um, my own firm and then you know now i'm the chief revenue officer of of several um it's we're still using this method so it's um you know but i will our board meeting you know i'm here in person today for that so <laughs> we're we're definitely getting together in person um but i do know that for a lot of folks it, it take it took a lot of getting used to you know just the sort of the cadence and the way that that conversations happen in, I, I absolutely agree that having more in-depth conversations about strategy and, you know, I, I itch to find the whiteboard, <laughs> you know, I, I, I feel like the in-person collaboration around some of those kinds of things, business model, how the business is working, um, you know, even financials, things like that, it, it's much better. The quality of some of those conversations are much better in person and in collaboration with you know the right stakeholders i, I it, it there, there is something that sort of is left on the table i feel like in zoom and uh these kinds of forums yeah so i think that balance of in person and then being uh, over video is is a good thing okay that's good so i, I think the 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 big question that um a lot of the participants are wondering um, is just, you know, what advice would you give to women who want to try and break into the PE world? Um, and a, kind of a side question to that is, is there, is there an age gap where you feel like if you were to bring on someone on your team, Melissa, for example, um, you know, is there, is there a certain age that you're looking for? Is there, are we missing a piece of the you know, um, a certain, certain uh, age group? So I think, you know, there's a lot of different roles within private equity. And I think when you're looking at, you know, um, the path that Christina has had, you know, in banking and, you know, developing, you know, as a deal professional, um, you know, her whole career, that is, I, I, I don't know, right, that you can insert yourself without having that experience and seeing all those transactions and really understanding how those deals are structured. And, you know, I mean, there's just a lot of special, you know, specialized experience, you know, and Christine, I'm sure you can speak more to that, that goes along, you know, in that journey. It's kind of, you know, like, deciding to be a partner in a law firm all of a sudden, you know, as a second career. I mean, there's a lot that you learn experientially, you know, through um, all the different steps of the way. So I think that is, you know, that is difficult, right, to break into um, when you haven't had that um, experience and, and career track um, from, you know, from the get-go. It's not impossible, but I think it's a little more unique and um, and difficult. I think there are other roles and ways, right, to break into private equity. Um, you know, just operating partners. Um, there's a lot of portfolio operations groups that really depend on, um, you know, great operating experience in public or private companies. So that is, you know, huge in all functional areas in, you know, right in all industries. Mm -hmm. So I think that is, you know, amazing to be able, you know, if you are still an operator and to go into a private equity backed company, um, that is, you know, I think would be really exciting and, you know, interesting as well and absolutely achievable from, you know, your area of, you know, your functional expertise or your industry expertise and operating um, expertise. And then as we talked about the board members, I mean, we are very much looking, you know, at the different capabilities that, you know, I have a, a healthcare or a, actually it's a financial services company, but most of their um, customers are large provider networks. And so we needed somebody that had that provider voice around the boardroom table. So, you know, as we think about 
what voices do we need to be advising and to play this board role? Um, you know, there's a lot of different opportunities, I think, that, you know, open up to different functional experts or different industries to come into a company and be on that board that maybe is outside your industry, but there's a strong dependency and, you know, your knowledge is going to be very unique. So, I mean, that all said, I think it is finding your unique differentiator. Private equity needs all of that. It's a huge ecosystem. Um, and so it's really understanding what opportunities are there and, you know, what are the skill sets and the differentiators that you can bring um, because, you know, at the end of the day, right, it's all about creating value and creating great outcomes for our, you know, our stakeholders. Um, so, and if you can do that and, you know, um, position it in that way, I, I don't think there's a barrier to being able to break into private equity. That's perfect. Yeah, Melissa, you described kind of, I guess, my background in that. <laughs> lots of industry expertise, functional expertise, operations background. Um, so that's kind of what I did. I, you know, I followed sort of that trajectory. I did M&A consulting when I was with Deloitte. So I had the M&A back and a little, little bit of M&A background there with pharmaceutical companies when all that was happening. And so just being, you know, at the table at some of those different experiences and weaving them together and then really being able to leverage that in a value way for portfolio organizations and, and lead, you know, operating roles in some of those companies as well um, has, has led me to that place. And I did see a question, maybe it was Dolores uh, said, you know, are there experiences in PE for women in their late 50s, early 60s? I would say in some ways, if, if you haven't gone the, that traditional route of investment banking and you almost have to be in your 50s because you would have had to have had enough of those experiences to be really valuable and useful. I'm not sure if that's true, but I know that I couldn't have gone and done, you know, where, and sit in the chair that I sit in without some of those deeper experiences across the industry that I'm in. Yeah, I mean, I think in general, I would give the same advice to someone that was looking to break into private equity as I would, you know, any career advice. I think, you know, you got to find what you're passionate about, hard at, um, and Melissa's right. I mean, the ecosystem is really broad. I mean, there's certainly classic deal professionals, but there's also, you know, business development, investor relations, there's a lot of internal operations that go into running, especially large um, private equity firms such as Melissa's. Um, and as well, she's right. I mean, everything that we're doing is trying to build bigger, better, more valuable portfolio companies. And we need women every step of the way on the management teams, on the boards, et cetera. Um, you know, I think there's a lot of roles for women if you're talking about how to become, you know, a traditional deal professional, you know, honestly, I think you do have to put in the spade work in the beginning. There's very sort of proven paths to get to where, you know, um, you know, people want to go. You have to start in, in investment banking in management consulting, um, you know, work there for a couple of years. And that's not to say, you know, we have an, uh, somebody who's a VP at our, our firm and he started out doing something completely different for the first couple of years of his career, but then went back and did investment banking. And, you know, and we thought actually as an associate, it was great to have somebody that had a, a little bit more maturity. Um, so, you know, I don't, and I think business school is also another way to reorient yourself um, onto a more of a, a traditional um, deal focused career track. Uh, but I really do think, you know, Melissa's right. You, you know, you do really need to fundamentally understand, you know, the financials and modeling and, you know, industry trends and how to assess an investment, investment judgment, and then over time, you know, how to, how to really sell yourself and your firm and, and work with management teams. So, um, you know, it is like one of those 10,000 hour things you got to put in your time. Um, but, you know, the good thing is, is that the path is well understood and you can cut in at various times. Um, but I do think it's, you know, if you want to be a traditional deal professional at some time in your 20s, you got to start to do some of those activities that form the foundation of a successful deal professional career. That being said, there's there are 
you know, wonderful people who are very powerful in the private equity world that aren't deal professionals. And there's plenty of entry points to get in on one of those tracks. Really helpful. That's good. Um, a question recently came through. Have you found it difficult to raise a family or children in the private equity world, knowing the pressure and the usually the high growth fast rate that private equity lives in? I'm a mom. I have two kids and uh, I will be an empty nester in a couple of weeks. So um, I, you know, I've been in private equity for the last eight years, but I was also in big four consulting. So it was very akin to, you know, the travel, the hours. Um, I hosted 10 au pairs over the years to help, you know, raise my children. Um, I live very close to my parents and, you know, it takes a village and, um, and, you know, my career and work has always been really important to me. And it's been something that um, I've balanced, but I've had a lot of help along the way. Yeah, I'd have to agree. I have two children. I am an empty nester. I have one in, in college, um, so they're not at home all the time. And I had about six or seven nannies over those years and always had a ton of help. So, um, and always really enjoyed my work and it was extremely important to me. Uh, and my husband has, you know, just been a huge help. He's probably made some sacrifices and you know but now i would say as empty nesters uh he actually has an ability to flex into his role a bit more and and do some different things too so it does change you know after you have those after those kids leave the nest and um you're actually able to devote a lot more time and effort into something new or exciting or different so i think um it absolutely can be done. And I would never sort of shun or wait to have the family because of work. You're never ready is what I always say. You're never really ready. So just do it anyway, <laughs> because, because then you actually get that fulfilled enriched experience. So. I have a, you, most of you know, I have a, a soon to be six year old. And I think you learn how to juggle and balance more than you ever had to or knew you could. That's right. Um, before. And so I think it's, um, I think it's definitely something that's doable. But. And worth it. I mean, yeah. I wouldn't trade the experience. So it's, you know, it's tough. And I look at a lot of my colleagues who are, young and, you know, uh, we had a baby boom, I think last year and, you know, it's, it's such a wonderful time, um, you know, and, you know, all of how you, you know, experience, you know, life through your children as well. So it's, um, you know, it's, it's been great and I'm glad I've had the help and, um, and, you know, been able to juggle it. And I think that, you know, when I look at my kids who are 20 and 18, um, you know, my son is 20 and he really appreciates, right. Um, uh, you know, um, anybody right in the workplace, female, male, whatever, mm -hmm. he kind of doesn't see it, you know, differently. And, and I think that it was, you know, really helpful for my daughter as well to see, um, you know, um, women in the workplace and, you know, the, the things that I do and, you know, the travel that I did. So I think it's really healthy role modeling as well. Okay. No, that's perfect. That's perfect. Um, you know, I think as, as we kind of take everything we've talked about today and we look at the future, you know, I think that our biggest challenge is, is we have to continue to encourage female diversity. Um, I, you know, I take that very, um, I don't take that lightly when I present candidates, you know, to, to our, our clients, um, but, you know, pushing female diversity at the executive level and the board level, I think is so important. I think it's something that we have to own, uh, like you all had said in the beginning. And, um, you know, as we, as we continue pushing along and evolving with, with world post-pandemic pre-pandemic, whatever else we're going to face. Um, but I, um, I really, really appreciate you all spending time today and the response has been great. The, I'll let you know if I have any other questions that come through, but um, 
I think we've covered everything that we all discussed uh, that we wanted to talk about today. So, yeah, there was a question, um, Jen, mm -hmm. about uh, from Roxanne about any no, just saw that. setting up special initiatives or portals or platforms to solicit women candidates. Um, always a lot, you know, going on there, but. The one thing I would say is that there are some fabulous um, female board networks. So Athena Alliance, um, WBL, which is healthcare specific. Um, oh gosh, I mean, 30% um, coalition. I mean, there's just so, so many of them yeah. that are really great, great content, great development. Um, a lot of the universities have certification programs for um, independent directors. So. Um, you know, I would encourage you and the networks are phenomenal and the executive recruiters sometimes will tap into those networks and we certainly tap into those networks as well, um, because it, it really does have an extensive uh, group of, of talented um, mm -hmm. females. Yeah. And Roxanne, I can reach out to you after this as well and, and send you a few of those links to start to look at um, that might be helpful. So. Yeah, thank you so much, Jen, for hosting and having, yes. having us on. It's been really great. Yes, thank you it. all. I really appreciate your time. And uh, like I said, deep respect for each of you. So um, I really appreciate your time. Thank you, guys. Yeah, thank thank you. you. Thanks so much.